Greetings, my name is Ralph E. Smith, reporter and publisher for GuardianChronicle.com. Welcome to this special tribute to New York City Mayor David Dinkins by Dr. Ali Al-Rahman, retired warden from the New York City Department of Correction and currently a professor for 25 years at Nassau Community College in Long Island, New York, otherwise known as Strong Island. There's definitely a message in the music. Welcome to our listeners around the world. We want to thank Dr. Ali Al-Rahman for coming on GuardianChronicle.com to talk about New York City Mayor David Dinkins' legacy in black law enforcement and community relations in New York City. Talk about merging police departments. The idea of merging uh, the police departments was that can't do that because you had so many black managers mm -hmm. that once you merge uh, transit and housing with NYPD, you would have had uh, black captains to take over precincts. Mm -hmm. Then you had uh, chiefs, assistant chiefs, deputy chiefs that could go into units and stuff that. Uh, it would have made the NYPD look a lot better than it did at that point. How did the Guardians and Mayor David Dinkins work together to better the New York City community? Oh, okay. Well, that, that started, um, well, you know, we as the Guardians, we, we, we always became political. And... Uh, we were always a political group. We used to go up to Albany every year to talk to uh, the senators and the assembly people mm -hmm. and let them know, you know, what, what was needed in the city, for, especially for the people of color. Okay. And um, the year that um, Rob Johnson decided that he was going to run for district attorney is when we became more political. Uh -huh. Because at that time, I was uh, the chairperson of the Grand Council of Guardians also. Oh, okay. So we, we, I, I had the Grand Council of Guardians, I was the chair, uh -huh. and I was president uh -huh. of the Correction Guardians. And so we brought a lot of uh, what we were doing in correction over to the Grand Council. The Grand Council was political, but a lot of their things were, were dealing mainly with uh, with the police. And we decided that uh, so some of the things that we had to do was to get everyone involved. And when um, Johnson had stated that he was going to run for district attorney, we had people from the Grand Council go with him and stayed around him as his uh, protection. The, gu the Guardians provided security protection? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Wow. Not just the correction Guardians. It was, uh, Johnson was the uh, housing police Guardians. Oh, okay. That, that were with him mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, a number of uh, correction Guardians were with them also. I see. So the NYPD kind of frowned <laughs> on their people being involved in stuff like that, but uh -huh. you know, they never had any problems with the PBA running around with other people. Right. But you know, as soon as the black folks started helping other black folks, it became a problem. Uh -huh. So um, all everything we did was on the QT, so to speak. But it was mainly uh, housing guardians that were with uh, 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 District Attorney uh, Johnson at that time when he was running. Then when he when he, when he won. You know, that was, that was a big thing, and he, he, he was a friend. He was somebody that we befriended, and he, was, he worked with us. Um, with uh, Dinkins, you know, I ran into Bill Lynch, who was his, his point man, one day. And we started talking, and he said, oh, you know, you should uh, come and talk to us about some things, you know, get it going. And 
and uh, after a while, he said, you know, David's thinking about running for mayor. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay, well, well, we'll be with him. We'll do the same thing that we did with, with Johnson. Okay. We'll put people with him and around him, and uh, that worked for quite a, while, a bit. Mm -hmm. So that's how we got in, into that. So we were, uh, we had different teams that would go out with him when he had speaking engagements and things of that nature. You know, because NYPD weren't supplying anybody. We were trying to figure out who, who were these people that were with him. Mm -hmm. And and we stayed with him until he won. That uh, primary night was big. Mm -hmm. And primary night was uh, an eye opener for a lot, a lot of people. Um, that night we were over at the hotel. We had different teams there. We had set up a center, you know, communication center, where we we would be talking to everyone. We had uh, the radios, and we had set up uh, just like you would do a, a regular uh, executive protection team. Mm -hmm. So that worked well and um, going into that evening when it started looking like he was going to win all of a sudden you know we had a number of people from nypd start drifting in and and talking to us and they would say well, what can we do we said nothing mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't want you to do nothing we got him <laughs> right, right you guys weren't here before so you know it's no sense of you being here now right 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 so if you want to do something, you can go up on the balcony and, and watch. Mm -hmm. But we're handling this. And then their boss came in, and I spoke to him, and he said, well, what are you guys going to do? How are you doing? How do you have this plan? And I, I sat him down, and I told him, listen, this is what we're doing. This is a regular security protection outfit. Right. This is not a, a fly-by-night group. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, what, what are you guys doing in case you... And said, listen, we have things set in place already. Already? You know, because we had, we had escape cars uh, in the back of the hotel just in case something happened. And we could get him out of there fast. And we had the cars ready to go if, if need be. You know, just like they do mm -hmm. in the regular protection schemes. Right. You know, you have you have the area that you that you take the person out. And we did the same thing. So once he won, and, uh, to, and I think he was a captain at the time, he said, well, what do you want my guys to do? Because once he wins, you know, he's ours. He's, he's our guy, you know. Mm -hmm. So we said, well, until he's your guy, when he leaves this building, he's ours. Right, right, right. Tomorrow, he's yours. Okay. Tonight, he's ours. Mm -hmm. And... They, they respected that. Okay. They, they respected it. And yeah. um, that evening, once he won, and we had the big, you know, the big to-do, the, the greetings and the, his speech. Mm -hmm. And after that, he didn't have to go anywhere because we had set up the, the presidential suite for him in case he won. Mm -hmm. So that's where he was at. And then that morning, we were moving him out and... Uh, that's when NYPD came in and took over. It, it was then their responsibility. Okay. So then they had to meet with uh, all the day's people mm -hmm. and find out exactly what they wanted. But we were remembered for what we did. And we stayed with them all the way through to the inauguration. Okay. So they, they had us all over there. And uh, we were going to send some of our people over to NYPD to work as intelligence unit, but then that, that was shut down mm. because of uh, the labor differences, that, which, you know, nobody wanted to explain, but we, we understood where that was coming from. Okay. You know, NYPD didn't want their people you know, being overlooked. Mm -hmm. So what, what they did was they came to us and asked us, who we wanted to be in that unit that protected him. Mm -hmm. And we chose everybody that went in there. Okay. Everyone that was with that first group that was with uh, Dave, we picked them. We even had, had the boss promoted. Wow. And 
we were given a, another captain mm-hmm. to to run it, and we we picked an African American captain. Okay, and he was the only one that had a uh, a precinct. Mm-hmm. And when they told him that he was coming over, he he was surprised. And um, when he got in there, you know, he thought he did it all on his own until some of the the people they had a few sergeants in there that knew because they were guardian members. Right, right, he said, right. You know, you know how you got here? <laughs> and he said, Yeah, I earned it. They said, No, 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 no. Right. Who got you in there? Guardians. Uh, Ali Rockman and the, the guardians. Yeah, yeah, that's how you got in here. Right, right, right. So he looked me up and came to, came to talk to me about it. Okay. He said, did you, uh, yeah. I said, yeah, we picked you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah it wasn't, wasn't a big deal. Yeah. I said, but this, this goes on in, in the city all the time. All the time. Picking people. It's a political move. Right, right, right. Well, were you going to just go to a precinct and, and, and be in there for what? Mm-hmm. So um, he came in and then he, he looked after the people, because we kept our sergeants and stuff in there mm-hmm. that we knew. So it was, it was good. It was good for us. Mm-hmm. It was good for Dave. And he had people around him that, that knew him and that he knew. And he was, he was uh, very comfortable with them mm-hmm. up until he, he left. So that was good. And we, it was something that we accomplished. Okay. And within the, you know, our department, when you saw the three chiefs get people into positions, to do things. Mm-hmm. And then the next big thing was uh, Mandela coming to New York. And we played a large role in that. What was that role? Yeah, we the Guardians, we handled Yankee Stadium. Wow. Which was the, the largest piece on their agenda. Okay. On 25th Street, that, that was fine because that was handled by uh, the State Department, mm-hmm. protective team, and a number of uh, uh, community people mm-hmm. that uh, they were in, involved with that, making sure that everything ran well. Mm-hmm. And so we were we were very happy with that, and they told us that we would have uh, Yankee Stadium. So we we did Yankee Stadium, mm. wow. and uh, welcomed by uh, Mandela and thanking us for what we did. I think we had over 150 uh, Guardian members there doing security at the at Yankee Stadium that day. At Yankee Stadium, wow. At Yankee Stadium, yeah. Mm. He came out to take the stage. We were lined up in front of the stage to make sure that nobody could run up on the stage. So there was a bunch of us out there, mm-hmm. and that 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 played very well with folks. Right, right. They, 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 they saw the guardians. I'm very happy, happy to see that. Mm-hmm. So Dave, Dave respected us. He liked us. And uh, there were things that we were doing that uh, were very helpful. I mean, we weren't just a security team. We helped with the criminal justice aspects of New York City. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned to you in the, in the tech was that uh, the safe city, safe streets. Yes, yes. Uh, mm-hmm. Pete. Okay. Uh, was his, uh, his calling card mm. for straightening out the city. Okay. So it, was, it became very, very interesting because I remember when um, when Koch tried to run it, the only people that ran that thing was, was the police department. The police department got people and they started making arrests and they, they were arresting a lot of people in, in lumps wow. and bringing them into correction. Mm-hmm. And, and we were so overcrowded in corrections because the police was making all of these arrests and say, you know, and, and basic criminal justice, you know, you have to look at the budget. Right. If the police are getting all the money to arrest people, what's going to go on with the courts? What's going to go on in, in corrections, the jails, and, and, and the prisons? Mm-hmm. Those people have to be a part of that budget. And that's one of the things that we brought up in, in the criminal justice meetings with the, 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 the mayor's people. If you're going to put X amount of cops on the street, you got to give us at least 10%. Mm. And you gotta, and you got to give the, the courts at least 5%. Okay. Because those are the places that are going to get overcrowded. You make a, a number of arrests, you arrest 300 people, you can't get all 300 people into the courts all the time. You're just going to fill up the, the bullpens. Right, right. 
You don't have all those judges, so you got to hire your judges. You got to hire court officers. You got to hire social workers to work with those people who work with the with the lawyers. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of things that you have to do, and then correction. If you hire all of those cops, you're going to have to hire more correction officers. You're going to have to hire more correction officers. So how did the That's right. so how did the Safe Street program work with corrections and the guardians? Well, Safe City, Safe Streets. The first thing they did was they put out for one thousand more beds in Rikers Island, mm. and then those uh, five hundred beds went to the oldest Bantam Correctional Center, and that that wasn't even built yet. Wow! But they had to do was build it. Mm -hmm. And that became the annex. That's the highest mm. um, security length building on Rikers Island now. Okay. You, you can spot it from anywhere. Right. If you're looking at Rikers Island, the tallest building there. The tallest building. OBCC's annex. OBCC. Which was a 500 bed. Okay. And the other 500 beds went to the uh, George Verno uh, Center, GRVC. Mm hmm. And that was uh, another 500 beds. Another 500 beds. Wow. Yeah. So with Safe City, Safe Streets, then you had 1,000 beds put into place okay. on Rikers Island. Mm -hmm. And the hiring of more correction officers. Okay. So with that, you know, the, the correction academy stayed full because the police academy was staying full because they were hiring more cops. They were hiring more correction officers. They were hiring more court officers. Yeah. Started looking with a balance. Mm -hmm. You had a balance there. With all that hiring that was done, uh, did that help reduce the crime? And and what happened when that crime was reduced? Did Giuliani try to take credit for it? Well, of course. Well, the crime went down. Mm -hmm. Crime went down precipitously. Okay. And. Um, it was looked upon as, okay, safe city, safe street works. Right. It works. The only thing that hurt Dave during that time period mm -hmm. was the boycott of the Koreans in, in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't handled well. Well, the police really didn't want to handle it. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the PBA, which was run by a guy that, uh, you know, that, well, to me, he was he was a racist. Okay. Uh, the PBA didn't like what Dave was doing because Dave was fighting to put in a um, civilian review board also, mm. which they finally got. And that was one of the things that the PBA really didn't want. They didn't want anybody looking at the cops. They didn't want that they checks and balances. They continue doing what they do mm -hmm. when they do it. Mm -hmm. And because Dave was doing that, you know, and everything got, uh, uh, how would you call when you say it? Twisted? It was magnified. Oh, okay. To the fullest extent. Mm -hmm. Instead of just being a little thing, it became a big thing. Okay. So, Civilian uh, Complaint Review Board, that became a big thing with the police department. Mm -hmm. uh, the PBA was telling its officers not to really do their job. Mm. Wow. Because they really weren't working, and when when it looked like this was going to become the law, it was mm -hmm. going to come into fruition. Mm -hmm. The PBA uh, <laughs> they had a riot. Mm. I call it a riot. Okay. The drunken guys. Yeah. Got this together and decided that they were going to storm City Hall. Mm -hmm. Wow. And because they didn't like that. Okay. And, and leading them on was uh, Rudy Giuliani. Question, question, hold it, hold it. Now, I, re I seem to remember cops jumping on top of cars. Was that, was this, was this, is, that, is, this is this what we're talking about? Yeah. Okay. They're jumping over cars in City Hall. Wow. Trying to get up the steps where you had more police officers there. Okay. To keep them away. Mm. And I was saying, you know, well, what are you going to do when you get into City Hall? What are y'all coming in there to do? What are y'all going to lynch? The right, man? Right, right, right. You guys are crazy. Oh, my God. But they were egged on by, by Giuliani. Egged on by And a bunch of drunken PBA people. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, they had, that's what they call the police riot out there. Right. 
And uh, you know, it was it was it was wild for a while. And Giuliani sure was had a hand in all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he sure did. <laughs> because he wanted to run for mayor. Mm -hmm. And when it looked like he wasn't going to win again, that's when they came up with this grand idea of selling the people on Staten Island mm -hmm. that they could leave the city. You know, you don't want to be in the city anymore. Mm. We, we want to get out of the city and we're going to form our own city. Our own city. Wow. And, you know, nobody said anything about it. Mm -hmm. But a bunch of folks, if, if you know the law, you knew that was bull crap. Right, 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 right. And even the, the, so the governor at the time, he could have told those people that, but he didn't. Mm -hmm. Because he was in with them. Okay. With this whole thing. Mm. He was okay. down. He was down with that move. Uh, seceding from New York City. Okay. So they put that on the ballot for 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 mayor. That was one of the things on the ballot, and that's what got Giuliani over. Mm. Because the white folks in Staten Island don't want to be a part of New York City anyway, because New York City is a little too dark for them. Okay. And, well, you see how they're acting now with the with the. <laughs> The COVID-19, oh, yeah. they, they don't want to close up anything. Mm -hmm. And when they close up that south side of, of, of Staten Island, these people went off. They said, oh, well, we're not going to pay any attention to that. Right. Well, that's the same thing that they were doing mm. at that time. Okay. It was the same thing. Same thing. We're yes. not going to deal with this. We, mm -hmm. we, if we can secede from New York, mm -hmm. we'll become a, a city unto ourselves. A city to themselves. No one's thinking that, oh, if they secede, don't they know that they won't have New York City Police Department? Sure. Don't they know they won't have the fire department? They won't have the Department of Sanitation? Nobody's explaining this crap to them. Right, 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 right. Even those who knew. Mm, mm. Because they were all in it. Okay. And so Dave lost by a couple of points. Mm -hmm. And so Giuliani became the mayor. Okay. When Giuliani became the mayor, he started talking about how he brought crime down. Crime was coming down when he came in from Fake City, Fake Streets. Right. Okay. It was coming down anyway. It was coming down anyway. Right. The time that he, he cleaned up uh, 42nd Street. Dave had signed off on 42nd Street with, um, with Disney and a couple of other large companies that came in and took the, you know all of those places out, those sex places mm -hmm. that were there, the sex bookstores and all of that stuff. All of that stuff had to go. And Dave was responsible for that. Giuliani took uh, credit for that. He took credit for the crime drop. He took credit for everything. And so people who know, who really know, know that all of the crime dropping was because of Dave and Faith and Fake Streets. Okay. Right. A number of people within those departments, um, correction, NYPD, mm -hmm. they know what the deal was. No, you know, so you're saying that they, they knew the deal. The bottom line is, is Mayor David Dinkins really cleaned up Manhattan with that Disney deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's when 42nd Street, when you started getting more tourists. Okay. People were scared to come to New York. New York was a joke. Mm. You, know, you go to New York, you know what's going to happen here. I'm going to get mugged down to 42nd Street. Here. Right. And it, that, would, that wasn't happening after a while. Right, right, right. And that was because David signed off on all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. He signed off just before he left office. Just before he left. So, you know, all of the goods, of course, it falls to Giuliani now. And that, so he started claiming it. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, oh, yeah, well, this did start happening when he was in. No, he's going to claim it all. Mm. Because we all know how he is. We've seen him in action. Right, right. We've, we've seen how he, how he did with Trump. Oh, with yeah. the Trump stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Until he had to go to court. When he got into court and the judge asked him, well, you know, don't you have any evidence? Do you have evidence of fraud, attorney? Because he knew when, the, when they asked him yeah. if he knew of any fraud that he was claiming. And he stood up in court and said it and couldn't prove it. That was his license. His law license was gone. Mm. So the judge had him say in court, well, Your Honor, this is not a fraud case. Wow. Oh. Well, that, that, 
the whole thing right there. That's what happened. Right. So he's not going to step over that line. Right, right. He's mm -hmm. not going to do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. So they've already pulled his old car. His, his car is out. Mm -hmm. But that's what he did. He just he right. stepped on top of all the stuff that Dave did. Mm -hmm. uh, to us, Dave was good. There were a number of people say, well, it didn't help him. Well, yes, he did. Mm -hmm. You just don't realize that he helped you. Right. There are a number of, of black folks who are in middle class jobs because they Dickens was in. Now he couldn't do everything for everyone. He only had one turn. Mm -hmm. You know, but some people just uh, they get away from you. You know, if you couldn't see it, then you don't know. Right, right. And you know, I was just lucky yeah. enough to be there. Right. When it was happening, when it happened, mm -hmm. and I, I benefited from it. Right. And, and the way he the way he moves and the way the guardians moved, everything is not going to be on the front page. You, you know, I mean, is, is is that the way? No, you can't put everything yeah. out there on the front page. Nobody has to know what you did, how you did it. Right, right. All we do is know that it was done. It was done. It got done. Right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And so you see what what happened in the correction department. You had so many black bosses running around there that they had to go out of the state to bring in a commissioner. Mm, mm, mm. And you've never been the same ever since. Right, 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 right. They're not going to let you run the place like you want to run it. Mm -hmm. It's going to be run how they want it run. So, so let me ask you a let me ask you a question. I mean, especially as a former warden. When you go outside, when, when, when management goes outside of the rank structure to uh, another state to appoint a commissioner, what does that do to morale? I mean, what does that do to the, to the officer who maybe says, one day I could be the commissioner, all I gotta do is follow, follow the rules and do the job and do it well. What does that do to morale if, if the department is simply gonna go outside the rank structure to hire and appoint a commissioner? No, it, it kills your morale. It will kill your morale. And the other thing that um, folks in the correction department are lucky about is that due to the city charter, the city charter is a wonderful thing that, that came out mm -hmm. for the Department of Correction because it kept this mayor, the mayor that you have now, from doing what he wanted to do by he wanted to bring in people to be wardens people from the outside didn't even have to have, to have any experience mm. he just wanted to make lateral moves and make people wardens because they were managers i said no, that's not going to work and they said oh he tried to do it and i said well you know you had to tell people sometimes you got to show people what they have to look for right and i said listen you have a board of correction and you have the city charter. The city charter gives the board of correction things that they have to do. It also gives the correction department things to do. A person cannot be appointed laterally into the warden's rank. To become a warden in the New York City Department of Correction, you have to come from one of three ranks. Assistant deputy warden, Deputy warden, and then you become a warden. Right, 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 right. So those things are numbered in the city charter as warden number one, which is an assistant deputy warden, warden number two, which is a deputy warden, and warden three, which is a warden, full warden. And you cannot bring mm -hmm. someone from the outside to become a warden one, two, or three. They go through those steps, and if they mm -hmm. don't do it, mm -hmm. you can't bring them in. You can't so bring them in. Yeah. found that out wow. in his, his first term when he wanted to bring people in mm -hmm. to run the facility mm -hmm. and because they were managers, mm -hmm. which meant that there were going to be a lot of political people being put in to run these jails. Okay. And then it was explained to them by the COBA okay. that had to go through the city charter. Yeah. They changed the yeah. city charter mm -hmm. to do that.
And the mayor didn't have any votes to do that because that had to come from mm -hmm. the city council. Wait, which which man? You talking about de Blasio? Which man? De Blasio. De Blasio. Yeah, he's the one that came in and wanted to do that. Wow. Even people don't understand that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, people call me and ask me things. I say, well, look, why don't you read the city charter? Right. Why don't you speak to the Board of Correction? But now, I don't even send people to the Board of Correction because the Board of Correction seems to have been bought off or is gone out of its mind. Yeah. Or, I, used to, I used to go to the Board of Correction all the time and say, listen, your job is not just for the inmates. Your job is for everyone in the Department of Correction. Right, right. And if my people aren't being treated fairly, Mm -hmm. You guys have to investigate that. And that, that's one of the first things I did when I became president mm -hmm. of the Guardians. Mm -hmm. I went to the Board of Correction. I said, you know, my people are being passed over for warden jobs. Mm -hmm. And these people say that uh, they want somebody with intelligence, they want somebody who, who has a college degree. And I said, I've got people with master's degree. I have one who has a, a PhD. A PhD? And, wow. and, and, you people that was uh, Pat Jackson at the time, he was a clinical psychologist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they have passed over this man for a job he gave to someone whose only education was a, a GED. A GED? No, you got to come oh. with that, right? Oh my God. And so they investigated and then they, they held off for it for a while and then they finally came up with the investigation and said, yeah, there was something wrong with that. And that, um, Black employees were being disciplined much more than the white employees with the same charges. Mm -hmm. the, the white employee would get uh, a fine or maybe a slap on the wrist. Okay. Uh, the black officer would get uh, two or three days in the street. Mm -hmm. So there were a number of things that were going on. I said, look, this is your job. This is what y'all are supposed to do. Yeah. We're not there just for the inmates. Yeah. Right. We have to get them mm -hmm. to, to do their job mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then I'm gonna have to go to the mayor. Right. Tell him. Okay. <laughs> so, so you know, things like yeah, that. Yeah. When, when, when so, you know the mayor. Right. So so that was then with with Mayor Dinkins, but now in the year 2020, wow, where does the time just go? Is the correction is the board of correction useful? Is it is is it is it a, is it a body that's doing the job or is it just a a mouthpiece for... Uh, no, it, it, it's more like a, a, a place for a lot of political point of view and a lot of advocates, okay. as they call themselves. Advocates, right. Advocates mm -hmm. for the inmates. Whereas most of these advocates are former inmates and they want the places to run how they want it run. Right. And, and that's why you have all these problems. You can't put anybody in solitary. I mean, sometimes people belong in violence. If they're going around yeah. slashing people yeah. every day yeah. and assaulting people, you got to put them somewhere. In the place, in the time, for everything and everyone. Mm -hmm. But this, uh, this new board is, is repetitious. I, I always used to tell folks, you know, the board is only doing the same job that the State Commission of Correction does. Mm -hmm. so both of these agencies do the same thing. Why are you running two? Well, because one is a political boondoggle. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can appoint people to jobs, and that, that helps you when you want to run for office again. Right. That, that's what that is. Mm -hmm. How do people get on the court of correction? Well, how do they get on there? That's the, that's the question. Right, right. Who appoints people to the board of correction? Comes out of the mayor's office. Okay. Do you, do you think that in the year 2021 with the Honorable Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams running for mayor, do you think do you, do you think that'll make a, a difference if he wins? Uh, what, what 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 do you see? What is what's your vision for this? So I, I think it'll make a, a big difference. Uh, Eric knows criminal justice. Eric knows the city that. Uh, more than seven, eight years now mm -hmm. dealing with uh, the politics of the jobs. Mm -hmm. He's been through the police department. He knows people in all the other departments. He, and he knows criminal justice. Right. So I, I think he, he would do an excellent job. Okay. 
the worst thing that you could do is get someone in who wants to do the same thing that uh, the Blasio does. Okay. Just sell out. Mm-hmm. And if, if you do that, then there's no hope for the city because you're going to have more problems with the cops and everything. You're not going to have problems with the police with Eric because Eric knows the job. He knows the job. A retired he captain, knows right? He guy. He knows the tricks. Yeah. That go along with what, what these guys do. <laughs> right. He right. knows who's working and who's not working. And who's not working. He can look at the, the, the maps and the, the jobs that go out and he'll know what's going on. Mm-hmm. So he he's got he's got a foot up mm-hmm. on just about everyone except they'd be scared because they don't want another black man in office. <laughs> right, right, right. Mm-hmm. He has to get the vote out. If you can get the vote out, mm-hmm. he'll be good. He'll be good for New York City. Okay. Uh, you know, Eric well. You know him well, okay. I used to think of him as, as a protege. Mm-hmm. After me, uh, as when I was chair. Uh, he came after you? Grand Council of Audience. Okay. Took my spot, and then. He took your spot. After okay. he left, and uh, Charlie Billings took over. Oh, okay. He was the president of the 100 Blacks in, in law enforcement, right? I think he. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's he knows the job. He knows the job. A lot of experience behind him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the saying that we stand on someone's great shoulders. All and of these. We know the shoulders. Right. And we all do. Right. Right. We all do. Right. Right. And the Honorable David Dinkins was the first shoulders that many stood on. Oh yeah, and he will tell you the shoulders that he stood on. Mm-hmm. He will tell you about those folks. Okay. And that was one of his, his favorite things that we all stand on someone else's shoulders. We all stand on somebody else's shoulders. And, and, and we keep standing on shoulders that we reach up and we will get there to where we want to be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that was one of Dave's favorite things. That we all stand on someone else's shoulders. We all stand on someone else's shoulders. And he would name the people whose shoulders he stood on. Right. right. As he started uh, his climb mm-hmm. into politics. Yes. And, and the first couple of times he ran, he lost. Right. You know, they just fortified him some more. Mm-hmm. When he started talking to other people and said, well, he did this. And then he stood up and, okay, well, I'll stand on those shoulders. Right. I'll keep moving up. As we continue to move into hopefully a blessed year with a new United States president and vice president and, and administration, hopefully black law enforcement will remember that we all stand on somebody's shoulders. Oh, well, that's true. Yes. And you have to have the personality for that. Yes. There is always, always someone who says, I don't understand, I did this all myself. Mm-hmm. And no one does it all themselves. No one, right. Yes. You know, but you always have people say, I did this all my own. I don't owe this to anybody. Mm-hmm. And then listen, the, the reason that you're here now is because somebody else stood there before you. Right. And you're standing on somebody's shoulders now, so don't tell me that you did this on your own. You didn't do this on your own. That's right. You were there because someone else was there before you. That's right. Yeah, you have to remember that. Because if you don't remember that, and you think you did it all on your own, then you're going to be owned by somebody else. That's right. That's right. And and yeah. you, sir, Dr. Ali Al Rockman, former warden at the New York City Department of Corrections, you have been instrumental in helping many, many officers of color and and officers in general move up stand up and be up on the job and many people owe you a word of gratitude and thanks well i appreciate that but i i try to uh, do the best that i can with, with everyone yeah, yeah, and 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 I'm and, 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 standing on someone else's shoulders. That's right. And I did that. That's right. That's right. I know you don't. I know you don't like you know to be blown up, you know, and and, and you know what? But we, guardians, and my listeners want to give you your flowers while you can smell them. 
And that's something that we don't, we don't, we don't, maybe I, in my opinion, I don't think we do enough of. We don't maybe sometimes reach back and thank people that, that have helped us through our career, uh, in our communities, and in life in general. And, Definitely. You, you know? But yeah. I, I just feel that I can still do some more because mm -hmm. I've got uh, people every day, you know, I'm still teaching, teach remotely. You teach remotely? And so they don't get the full flavor mm -hmm. of what I do. Okay. But they can hear it in my voice. Oh, okay. But uh, when I'm in the classroom, you know, it's like a performance. Right. <laughs> <And> so <laughs> I, hey. I, I have fun in there. I try to teach them mm -hmm. everything that I know about what they're getting ready to get into. Because I teach people who are going on to be attorneys and okay. uh, uh, police officers. Wow. Correction officers. And everything when they come to me and say, "Well, I'm going to be a detective." I said, "Well, mm -hmm. before you become a detective, you're going to have to be an officer first. You with people. Mm -hmm. Everything that you do is a people job. People. If you don't know how to deal with people, then you get into the wrong bit. Right. Right. Because you have to know how to deal with people first. And um, they seem to enjoy it because I get students in maybe two or three classes that they take with me. Mm -hmm. And then they, they'll write me and tell me that they're going into certain academies and things. Mm -hmm. And they say, okay, well, we're good. Or where should I go well, when, once I finish uh, in my associate's degree? Where should I go for the bachelor's degree and then a master's? Should I go to one of the regular colleges? And I say, well, there's more colleges around if you want to. Right. If you want to travel, if you want to go out of state, then there are other schools that could help you with that. Mm -hmm. But in New York, you know, you got John Jay, you got uh, John Jay College of Criminal Justice, that's one of the places. Right. Long Island University has, has a very good uh, criminal justice program. Where do you teach at? I, I teach at Na Nassau Community College. Okay. Wow. Part of the State University of New York. Wow. Been there, and they tell me I've been there 25 years already. You've been there 25 years said, already? What? <laughs> what? I don't believe it. Wow. Yes, and still, that, that's what it was, 25 years already. 25, when did you make 25 years there? Uh, this year. This year? Wow. Yep. Oh, congratulations, congratulations. Yes. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. mm. I, I left correction in 94, and I started over here in 95. Oh, okay. Wow. Smooth transition, that's nice. Yep. And you're still teaching and reaching. Uh, I try my best to. That way it keeps me young too. That keeps you young too. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And, and and what words what what words of preparation, that powerful P, you know, proper preparation prevents poor performance. Always be ready to perform and don't forget to pray. What words of preparation would you have for students wanting to enter law enforcement? Well, we want to end this law enforcement, you have to be a people person. Mm -hmm. You have to know people, you have to like people. Okay. But if you get into law enforcement, that's all you're going to do is deal with people. Mm -hmm. So you have to have good interpersonal, interpersonal communication skills. Mm -hmm. You know how to talk to people, how not to talk at people, mm -hmm. and, and have some empathy for folks because a lot of people are suffering these days. Right. But you have to have empathy for folks and understand some of the things that they're going through. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I try to uh, get over to them. That empathy plays a large role in it. How can you empathize? Well, you would have had to have been there mm -hmm. or seen it before. Mm -hmm. So there, there's things that go on with people that you just can't put your finger on, but you can feel it. Okay. And that's the empathizing with it. Mm -hmm. Well, I know how this person feels because I, I've been there before. Mm -hmm. I've felt that. Mm -hmm. And if you can do that, then you're you're a good person, and you could, you're the type of person that can help other people. Mm -hmm. Having the people skills helps you to be a good to great law enforcement officer. That that that's what I'm I'm hearing from you. That's, that's correct. You have to have those skills, and, and you develop those skills. Mm -hmm. It doesn't come to you at one time, mm -hmm. but over time. Over time. All of your experiences go into who you are. Mm -hmm. And if you can get those experiences to go with you with 
empathy and everything else, you you got it. You're going to be a good officer and a good person. That's what a good officer is, a good person. Okay. You, you know, I, I remember at Rikers Island and in Corrections, you and Eddie Graham and some other good brothers and sisters ran a program called Institute for Inner Development and you had a youth program where officers went to different schools in New York City and went into the, went into the community and, right. went in, and went into those communities. I want you to speak about that because when that program was cut, I thought that was the greatest travesty, the, the, greatest, the greatest problem, the greatest misstep that Corrections did cutting that program, reaching out and working in the community and bringing those students into the jails so that the inmates and staff could speak to them and help them to understand the consequences of bad actions and help them understand that this is a great career and this is the only way you should come into Rikers Island as a correction officer and work your way up. Speak, speak about that program if, 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 you, you know, if you have a few more minutes. Yeah, well, the program worked wonders. Uh, I remember seeing the students come through. Mm -hmm. uh, matter of fact, the, the person that was, that was the chairperson of the Criminal Justice Department over at Nassau Community College, mm -hmm. he brought a couple of classes over. Okay. And that's how he knew about me. Mm. And that's why he asked me to come over and teach a correcting class for him. Oh, okay. And I've been over there ever since. Right, right. But uh, no, that that was a, a wonderful program. Uh, but you know what happens with that when you're doing well? Mm -hmm. I remember a um, there was a newspaper columnist that came over to to the jail mm -hmm. uh, to ask about our programs. Okay. And. When I explained to him what we were doing and how it was going, and he started right. He, he thought it was very, very good. He started writing it up. He wanted to mm -hmm. interview people and things of that nature. And I said, okay, that would be fine. I don't mind opening it up to uh, to the public and letting the public know. Right. And then he went back to his uh, editor. Mm -hmm. Because he was supposed to call me the next day to try to set up, you know, appointment uh -huh. to talk to my officers and maybe a group of kids that were coming in. Uh -huh. And he told me that uh, the editor said it was, it was the program was too positive. Too positive. So they were putting the paper. Wow. And I said, what? He said, yeah, they think it's too positive. And I said, so what they're, they're looking for, riots and things of that nature, people getting hurt. And that, that would sell newspapers, but, you know, something like this that keeps kids off in the streets mm. and, and, and make them better people, that's not newsworthy. Okay. And I always remember that, mm. Mm. that there were some papers that, uh, you know, I never gave an interview to after that okay. because of what had transpired there. Mm -hmm. wow. And matter of fact, it was one of those papers it ran a, a, a matchup job on me when I retired. It mm, mm, mm. uh, ran an article about four months after I had retired. Okay. And something had happened on Rodney Valley, and they blamed it on me. They blamed it on you. Wow. Yeah, they, yeah, they, yeah, they put it in the paper. Then. The only reason they have any problems now is because the man that's running the jail is uh, Ali Al Rockman. Mm, mm. And he's running the jail, and the, the, the inmates are running the asylum. Wow. And I had to call them up and I said, well, where did you get this information from? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because yeah. I've been retired for four months. Mm -hmm. I haven't been over there at that jail. The jail, when, when did they have this riot? Mm -hmm. About three weeks ago? Mm -hmm. I was nowhere near that place. Matter of fact, I was, I was down in Puerto Rico. So <laughs> I don't know where you get your information from. Right. But you will be here for my attorney yeah. if, if you don't run a retraction. That's right. And not on page 56. Right. You better put it right in that same area where you had your editorial. Mm -hmm. Because I'm coming to get you. Mm -hmm. yeah, they, oh, they, uh, they apologize and stuff. I said, well, I know where that's coming from. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's coming from the, the Giuliani administration. Yeah. Of whom I never got along with anyway, but uh, mm -hmm. 
that they were trying to just do the smoke screen. If I wanted to get another job, they were trying to put that out on me. Wow. You know, I said, no, you're not going to gaslight me with that stupid stuff. Yeah. yeah. So those kind of things happen. Mm-hmm. And that's the kind of stuff I like to tell people about also. Mm-hmm. That people will put stuff out there just to hurt you mm-hmm. if you're doing well. If you're doing well. Wow. Okay. Yeah, if you're doing well, then mm-hmm. they're not gonna they're not gonna like that what you're doing. Mm-hmm. So if you get that you're helping to keep kids off of the street and you're doing these great things, they will find something to do to hurt your image. Because all it only a person has to see it once. Okay. And they will remember your name and remember that it was something bad assigned to it. Yeah. They won't look into the paper three or two or three weeks later mm-hmm. that says, oh, okay, we're sorry, we didn't mean that mm-hmm. because he wasn't there. Yeah. They'll always remember that with your name. So you have to be very careful with these folks. Mm-hmm. You know, some, some of those students that went through that program with you and, and, and Eddie Graham and, and others, many of them uh, have become police officers correction officers and teachers, you know? I mean, they really appreciate yeah. that program, you know? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, it, it's been a blessing to at least, I, I want to say at, at least, well, I think the, the number that I remember was 10,000, about 10,000 students per year, you know? And, and, and 10,000 students per year with zero incidents. Not one incident. Zero incident, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. Ho- hopefully, I mean, hopefully, maybe history will repeat itself, and somewhere down the road in 2021, maybe they'll be able to revise and revitalize that program. Maybe they'll be able to really reach out and be and be about the community business instead of just trying to build more jails in the community. Maybe they'll be trying to reach back, reach back into those schools and help those students become outstanding community leaders. Right, and then you won't need the jails. That's right, that's right. Yeah, okay. Yep. Want, want to thank you again, Warden Ali Rahman, Dr. Ali Rahman. My, my pleasure, <laughs> my pleasure all the time. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes. Thank you for having me on. Yes, sir, and I appreciate your time on this holiday. I appreciate this time that you spent speaking actually to the world now. And now when I say to the world, imagine how we started. We started out as a newspaper. Guardian Chronicle yeah. started out as a printed newspaper. And you know, and, and keeping that vision going, now in 2020, we are reaching out to the world. And that's very important because the world needs to know about the incredible work that the New York City Correction Guardians and Guardian members are doing. That's correct. Well, I thank you too, Smitty, because you're doing a heck of a job there. Thank you. I, I remember when, when we started. Yes, sir. I said, Smitty, you have a computer? <laughs> I want you to do this for us. Yeah. And you did. Yeah. And look at you now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Going around the world with this stuff. So very good, Smitty. I appreciate you, brother. Thank you so much. Thank, thank, thank you. Uh, I, have to, I have to get back and talk to my family now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank. Okay, brother. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving to you. Happy Thanksgiving to you and to your family. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And to you and Renee and and and, and the little fellow. Well, he's probably not a little fellow now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he, he's a 20, 21 year old now. Isn't that something? Yes, he's a man now. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, brother. Okay, brother. Thank you so much, man. You take care. Thank you. Take care. Peace and peace and safety to you and your family. And yeah, you too. Thank you. Thank you.